Hello, my fellow citizens of all nations. Right now, I'm going to talk about um, a very interesting uh, topic, which is uh, the somewhat uncomfortable and bitter truth about the crowds and the uh, difference between the reality and what crowds believe to be the reality, essentially what public believes to be reality, and what is really a reality. Because there is a big difference between these two things. And, uh, you know, this will be right now sort of a summary of uh, work of uh, Gustave Le Bon, who wrote a book about this subject called The Crowds, uh, the study of a popular mind. And let's start uh, from one of the very simple things. The crowds are not rational. In fact, uh, in crowds, the sentiments, em emotions are uh, spread very quickly. And usually, crowds are not controllable. And you cannot control them. And one of the reasons uh, that happens is that individual in crowds uh, loses his or her uh, self, meaning he or she knows that she now became something, a part of something bigger. For example, uh, a single human being knows that he cannot uh, loot a shop or a big uh, center alone, but uh, if uh, crowds are gathered together and they are uh, looting together, then the individuals will feel much more encouraged to do so because others are doing so. And they also become a sort of anonymous. Basically, their behavior is not only their own behavior. Their behavior is part of a crowd already, part of a uh, something greater. Now, this is not the only thing, right? Crowds are not interested in uh, logic or a reason. You cannot uh, possibly reason with the crowds. Uh, people uh, that uh, think that they can reason with a crowds, they are very naive. And experience has not taught them very simple facts about the crowds. Crowds not care about the reason. Just observe what uh, crowds believe in. Crowds believe in all, all sorts of uh, irrational stuff. Even though the science has already destroyed the delusions of um, crowds, yet uh, crowds simply uh, prefer to uh, basically reject those um, truths and be convinced by still these delusions which the crowds really uh, believe in. Uh, but that's not the only thing. In fact, uh, crowds are the delusional not only in that way, but every time you see an individual that has a leader, right? Uh, in fact, uh, not individual, but crowds. Crowds are the ones that need the leader. It's, a, it's just a natural order, order, order. And individuals are the ones that become the leader of the crowds. Meaning they become the prophets uh, or messengers or whatever of the crowds. They, uh, leaders, will be ones that are charge of the crowds. And they are the ones that lead the crowds. For example, Napoleon is a great example. You know, there's a kind of very interesting observation that uh, usually, a slave starts uh, by demanding justice, and he ends up wearing the crown. Uh, Napole in case of Napoleon, it's kind of true. And uh, this also shows another thing, that usually crowds are not necessarily evil. Uh, their aspirations could be quite noble as well. But it uh, quickly turns into something disastrous, because they are not in control of themselves. Because they are in control of the chieftain, to put it bluntly. And they obey the chieftain like crazy. They reject themselves, they show full devotion to their, their leader. 
whether it will be religion or a simple being or whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. They devote everything. They have a strong faith in them. They are willing to do whatever for their cult uh, leader, basically. And they just, uh, they are willing to sacrifice their children, their wife, uh, their everything for their leader. And that's how devout they usually become. And uh, this is uh, dangerous. Dangerous because um, this leads to a chaos, this leads to destruction. In fact, uh, Gustav Le Bon was not uh, alive and he did not witness the World War II. Uh, but uh, the World War II showed uh, us uh, something very interesting, how dangerous and scary the mentality of the crowd is because uh, we have to realize that, um, in fact, majority of Germans were on were convinced were convinced by this um, fascist ideology. Uh, they were fed these fairy tales, uh, this nonsense. But they, they again, crowds do, do not care about reason. They are uh, stimulated and and easily manipulated by some sort of um, expressions. And there was entire. Uh, propaganda movies and uh, posters and all sorts of crazy, crazy conspiracies used by um, Nazis to convince the population. And majority of them and quite a number of them were convinced. Convinced in this crazy, crazy ideology, which actually achieved something impossible, which literally destroyed one of the most advanced countries on the planet. It li literally reduced uh, this mo most advanced country to the ground. Uh, the ground because... Now, the crowd started to worship the leadership, the, 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 this image of a man, of Hitler. Crowds worshipped him, and just like a blind sheep, uh, they followed him to his death. Uh, which, by the way, reminds me of another example, which is that Jesus usually refers to crowds as uh, people. Is like Jesus refers to people as sheep, because people are like sheep. Which is um, not a nice thing to say about people, comparing people to sheep. But it is true. People are like that. People are like sheep and they need the leader. They still desire somebody to take, take care of them. Now, uh, what is um, even more interesting is that uh, when he was writing uh, this, bo uh, this book, he said something uh, like... It's about to happen that the divine mandate of a king will be, is about to be replaced by the divine mandate of people or crowds. And we live already in that period where the divine mandate of a king already has been replaced by the divine mandate of a crowd. And we see it in a different form today. For example, a majority of the countries on this planet claim to be democracies. They claim to be elected by people. Literally. Yet uh, they are not really a democracy, and neither they are elected by people. But because the divine mandate of um, king has been replaced by the divine mandate of a crowd or people, they need this. They feel like they need this because uh, without it, they won't have the, the justification to rule. So they have to falsify it. Now, this is, by the way, um, n uh, uh, nothing. The delusion of the uh, delusions of the crowds goes even further. Uh, for example, the crowds. For example, uh, the, for example, let's acknowledge that different crowds are different. Um, now, what he refers to as a race uh, in his book, uh, basically, is something that different countries develop because of complex reasons, such as uh, invasions, um, um, I don't know, maybe, uh, crazy uh, killings, uh, maybe some sort of enslavement or enslavement of other people, and etc. Basically, when these people get together, they some, uh, call, like, um, create a bigger tribe, and they need sort of a king and that's how they become even bigger and they, then they are established as a nation and this is very complex and random reasons which actually creates the country in fact uh, 
if we look at the history, uh, history is full of crazy, crazy stuff. Like one of the most unpredictable things in the world. Like history is absolutely unpredictable because not because there there is something wrong with the history itself. No, uh, because we are observing the human history. Because the human history is created by the crowds, and crowds are irrational and not smart at all. In fact. Uh, one has to understand that uh, if crowds were rational, history would not exist at all. Like human history would not exist. Because crowds are basically motivated to sacrifice themselves for things they have little or no understanding whatsoever. For example, people that uh, fight for country, their country. Why, uh, why? Imagine if that uh, in people were smart. They would never fight. Because they would understand that, uh, first of all, it is against your direct interest to fight for your country. Because if you die, nothing really matters. Also, that's the third, first point. The second point is that your country is not really your country. What do you mean? This is The country is an absolutely arbitrary creation, literally. The country is an arbitrary creation. And, in fact, uh, the country is usually... Uh, r restrict the liberties uh, of individual, and uh, as time passes, the liberties of people are getting reduced. Simply, uh, and uh, they end up in uh, dictatorship. Also, now another completely another thing is when people fight for dictatorship. Uh, that's a, a, the, the, a, you need basically a specific type of foolishness. Uh, foolishness, which is not that hard, like right? It is not hard to fool the crowds. It is not hard at all. In fact, it is easier to fool like 10 million, 100 million people than to fool a single individual. And one of the interesting thing is that hermits, for example, usually avoid crowds because they are afraid of the influence of the crowds. Because there is this contagious moment where certain emotions and etc. are contagious within the crowd. You know, one there to interesting. Another interesting thing is that uh, the crow, the qualities of crowds are very average. Uh, if you gather a random uh, thirty thousand people, their collective capabilities will be co most likely quite average. I mean, they would not be able to build a nuclear power plant or anything like that. And yet, what is even more be there bizarre is that humans, for example, observe the uh, satellites uh, in in space. Uh, and they observe the inventions of this civilization, what we have right now so far, and they say that, oh, we, humans, or we, specific people, or country, or etc., invented these things. Excuse me? It is an objective fact that the creation of these technologies and these achievements has nothing to do with the majority of the people. Sorry. Uh, if, you, if your great great ancestors, probably, or my ancestors, for example, worked... Uh, is let's say let's assume that our ancestors worked as slaves uh, while uh, while they were build, uh, building the pyramid. So what? The, you think just because they were worked there as a slave, uh, they contributed somehow to that uh, the building of the pyramid? Well, one answer is yes, but at the same time, uh, especially during that period. What really matters, and what really mattered was the intelligence. Intelligence and those people that actually designed this thing and calculated these things. Same for the electricity, for example, same for the internet, same for um, the um, cars, whatever car you want. This is, these are inventions of individuals, but the crowd like to cl claim it for themselves. They like to say that, oh, we invented this, we did this, we did that. What? This is just delusion. If you again, if you gather a hundred thousand random people, they won't be able to reinvent the internet. They won't be able to uh, build a nuclear power plant. Uh, they won't be able to put uh, a man on the moon because average uh, quality of the crowds, uh, qu in fact, um, uh, qu quality of uh, their capability, capability of crowd is really average. And what is interesting is that um, usually um, 
An abyss may exist basically between a great mathematician and uh, some random crowd. But the thing is that if that great mathematician is part of a crowd, he will be influenced by the crowd because he is not excluded from other things, other things uh, that influences people in general. He is under that control. Uh, you know, let's not forget that uh, during, for example, the Nazi period, intellectuals also were influenced by this because already crowds were hypnotized and they also became part of it. They started to believe it. It's really hard to resist them emotions, that irrationality that comes and that uh, basically attacks uh, the consciousness. Let's call, let's call it thing that attacks um, our mind, a savage primitive self. Because that's primitivity what usually overwhelms uh, human. You know, there is a lot of hidden violence and danger hidden within human beings and what shocked me, by the way, reading this uh, Gustav Le Bon's uh, book was that uh, how cruel the Bartholomew massacre turned out to be. Basically, w this is just crazy what happened in France. This is just crazy thing. How irrational when basically women and men uh, simply massacred so many people in a most cruel, brutal way, and they were proud of it. And some women, women were complaining because they were not allowed to observe the murder of the noble uh, and torture and murder of the noble. This is just a crazy, crazy. It's a cra and the, the things have been done by crowds. And his story is full of that type of example. So, uh, Byzantine Empire has so many of that history. Um, historical examples, but the, what he explained here just shocked me. Now, another interesting thing, about which is objective reality. Even to this day, every great civilization we know, in reality, so far, even to this day, has been managed by minority of individuals. It has never been managed by majority. It has never been managed by crowds. In fact, the civilizations we know to this day were created by minority of individuals who ruled over majority. And they were the ones that making the, those decisions. And they were the ones that put the actual foundation and everything. And this is true for the United States as well. Like uh, The foundation of the United States, which is considered the most powerful country today, was not uh, put... That foundation has not been made by crowds. That foundation has been made by minority of individuals. They did not care what majority of people thought. I mean, I don't know the history of the United States very well, but as far as I know, even uh, recently, it's been probably less than 100 years where um, that uh, basically... Uh, uh, they had the, the law, law, certain law basically that uh, differentiated between uh, uh, people from England, as far as I know, and people from other uh, European countries. And uh, the other, most people basically were looked down. For example, if you were Paul, you would be looked down uh, and you would not have as much rights. So, uh, the, the, those uh, foundation, you know, they, the way this figures understood that foundation. And, uh, like, if they could see, correct, United States, if founding fathers of United States could see a, a modern election in the United States, most of them probably would have had a heart attack and they would have died immediately <laughs> out of, uh, like, crew. They, they would not be able to believe what they were, were witnessing. Like, are you kidding me? Everybody is just going to vote, and these people are going to decide the who are they going to elect. This is just crazy. And if you look at, by the way, recent elections, especially elections uh, which happened in the last uh, 20 years in the United States, uh, basically, you would understand why you should, uh, why. Uh, Trusting crowds to make important decisions is not a good idea at all. <laughs> like it is not a good idea, because again, crowds are easily manipul. The crowds can be easily manipulated. Uh, they 
I'll get excited easily. And by the way, hedge rot is interesting. It is very hard uh, for crowd and takes a long time for crowds to believe something. But here's the thing: once they believe that something, they are not going to let it go. Once that thing is established, they are not letting it go. They are firmly going to defend it. They are not going to modify it and they are going to change anything in it. They are going to firmly defend it. In fact, uh, Gustave Le Bon argues that every great change that happened in human history is in fact uh, uh, rep is representation of the invisible changes that happened within the minds of the people. For example, the fall of the great Roman Empire. Now, the one argument would be to believe that Roman Empire actually fell because of um, corruption and because they could not handle these invasions. But another observation, which is really convincing and true, is that people did not uh, just just were fed up, and the culture of the Rome got undermined by Christianity, for example. And here is how and why. Basically, within the Roman, the legions of empire worshipped the empire. There was a sort of a cult of an empire, this which existed in empire. Basically, you can observe it even today, where there are princes and uh, kings, whatever. Some countries still have those. In fact, some kings uh, and uh, still rule certain countries, and there is nothing wrong with that. Uh, you can observe that the people worship those individuals. People have genuine worship toward them. And the same way, there has existed a strong sense of worshipping toward the empire or within the Roman Empire. There were um, some temples or the, the legions obeyed the empire for legions and for Romans. The empire was not just a human being. The empire was the representation of the gods, the representation of the will of gods. But uh, when um, you know, Christianity came into power and this ideology already undermined the cult of a, uh, Rome, uh, the cult of an empire. And, uh, in fact, uh, Christianity started uh, to slaughter a majority of uh, believers in Roman Empire. In fact, when Christianity became, was declared as the main religion of the Roman Empire, and not even 10% of the popular Roman Empire, population of the Roman Empire was uh, actually a Christian. But, of course, this is can, cannot only be blamed on Christianity, the fall of the Roman Empire. As well, there were some sort of other invisible changes within the Roman Empire. For example, they no longer, for whatever reason, they no longer believed in this way of life. And also, the ruling class became more and more corrupt and more and more weak because, uh, oh, because of all the prosperity and the wealth they received from their ancestors and the overwhelming influence they had, they became weaker and weaker, and they started to be detached from the reality, and they changed. And this is the story of basically every great civilization. Every great civilization goes this uh, circle, basically. Some, they, they rise because of random, unimaginable reason, because this is another thing which I already mentioned, like, his story is not reasonable. Like, you, who would believe that Rome would become an empire. Who could imagine that a dude that crucified himself on the cross would would have such an enormous influence uh, to our to the humanity? Who would imagine that a man in a desert uh, would uh, be so convinced and so confident that he would influence the history of history? Who could imagine such things? Nobody. It's just unbelievable. And who would imagine that uh, the, then the Persian Empire and the Byzantine Empire would fall uh, under that rule? Like, who could imagine such things? Like, this is not something that can be predicted. And anyone that says that, oh, I can predict, no. And this is one of the things, by the way, nobody can really predict the future or what will be. It's an extremely hard thing to do because, again, the people that actually make those decisions are not rational at all. And they can pretty much make any de decision, and we would just be like that. Now, let me read uh, some of the very few interesting notes here before we 
and before I end basically this uh, discussion. Here was um, where it is possible to induce the masses to adopt atheism. This belief would exhibit all the intolerant under of a religious sentiments and in its exterior form would soon become a cult. And by the way, this has been already proven. Uh, this already happened. One could argue that Soviet Union was such an empire, um, basically where people just uh, started to become a member of a cult, and uh, the cult quickly lost its power after Soviet Union uh, collapsed, basically. Because uh, now we receive this, uh, we witness this unique situation where elderly population, majority of them do not believe in anything, and the younger population starts to believe in something. Because their governments, the correct governments, needed legitimacy. And what many post Soviet Union governments did was to use religion to convince the population that the, that this was their legitimacy, basically. They used later that religion to convince the publics and convince the public that uh, they were the legitimate rulers. Uh, also, they revived a certain tradition which helped them. Now, there are just too many notes uh, I've made uh, while reading this book, and I'm just trying to pick uh, some very few uh, interesting ones, and I'm trying to see if uh, by any chance I forgot to mention some th some very important things. Yes, this is uh, the thing, by the way, I mentioned already, so I'm going to read uh, this thing. Prestige is a um, very important thing, right? The prestige. The empire had the prestige. The, he was worshipped, and uh, it is a big deal. The fact that the empire was worshipped. And is worshipped. Because legions fundamentally obeyed the empire. And for Roman people, the empire was a big deal. Who Even in Byzantine Empire, who was the empire was a big deal. For the people, it was considered a big deal. In fact, every empire was considered to be chosen by God. Also, one could argue that uh, the crowds are usually guided by examples and not by reason. And this is also what helped the Nazi regime. Now, interesting thing is that um, you know, when you talk about uh, some conspiracies and uh, stuff, people, the crowds already believe in crazy things. Well, crowds already believe in unreasonable stuff. Um, about some sort of uh, crowds believing karma, for example, crowds believing uh, that they will be resurrected after the majority of them. Plus, quite a large number of uh, people believe uh, about uh, hell, that there is such thing as hell and heaven, and there is such thing as um, angels and devils and stuff. Uh, and so what's the big of a deal if they start to believe in some crazy thing, right? The, the person the Nazi regime that's, uh, that convinced the population. So what? If people already believe in crazy, crazy things. So there is no, um, the, it's not a big deal. Because what, what, what does it matter if you believe, if you already believe in one crazy thing, what, uh, what, what, what a big deal it is if you believe in another crazy thing. Right? Uh, and this is it. Uh, the beginning of a revolution is in reality the end of a belief. And uh, this is, by the way, something when he talks about uh, the dying empire. Uh, the dying empire, actually, actually, what is very interesting, is the dying empire appears very powerful. But what really happens is that the dying empire already has nothing. The, well, the empire's population already no longer obeys the laws. They half-heartedly obey the laws. And they have in, in charge a chieftain. If, by the way, it does it remind you of something, some countries, for example, the chieftain, and the chieftain appears very tough and powerful, uh, while the empire already has no ideology, no belief, no faith, nothing. The empire is crumbling, but yet the image of the empire is so powerful. And yet, this type of empire, that type of empire is doomed to perish. Now, uh, in... Uh, Basically, this book, uh, for example, uh, Gustav Le Bon says uh, certain things about Latin crowds, and he is very critical of them, and he considers them basically very feminine, uh, and he has no good opinion about women and uh, 
children and uh, then uh, generally basically he has some strong opinions uh, which um, uh, could be probably argued but I do not know much about for example Latin crowds and I do not know much about the Anglo-Saxon crowd as he refers to in, the, in his book so I cannot really argue about all this thing but um, I could say that um, um, there, there, there is something interesting to pay attention to here because uh, the democracies, for example, the countries that have genuine democracies, the democracy in France is not the same democracy as it's in the United States and uh, yeah, the democracy that is in the United States is not the same democracy that is in Japan, for example. Uh, the race, what he refers to as a race, and as I, as I understand it, is something that is created randomly. Basically, culture of the nation and the influence of the nation. Basically, inner influence of the nation, how inner way the uh, nation... Not, uh, I don't want you to understand by race um, some sort of... Um, what it's called? Um, how a pe person looks, or genetics, or uh, etc. I want to understand the inner characteristic. Well, this is what I believe this is what it means by race. The inner characteristic human beings have. And the race, if you understand the race uh, this way, the definition of the race this way, we could see that uh, the people of different countries have a different characteristic. You know, the, even though, for example, seemingly, uh, for example, Latin American countries have the parliament and they have a, have, a, have judges and have courts and etc. Seemingly the same, but it, it doesn't work the same way it works in Germany, for example. And why is that? Uh, because fundamentally, nations are ruled from bottom to top, not from top to bottom. Meaning, uh, destiny of a nation will be the same as the character of its population is. Basically, the, the, the type of character the population of nation has, so it, is, it, is, it will exactly be the destiny of that nation. Because it is how it is influenced. Uh, and, you know... Um, if we observe it, really, the democracies, for example, do not work the same way in uh, majority of countries. In fact, in majority of countries, the democracies are disaster and failure, and it does not work, and yet in some countries work. But uh, even so, the, the countries uh, where that sort of system seems to work, is, it does not work the same way as it works in other countries. Again, as I've said already in example. For example, the democracies that exist in French and Germany and the United States and Japan, for example, is very different from each other. And some could even argue that some of those countries don't even have a democracy. For example, as far as I know, in Japan there is, exists a strong culture of uh, younger people obeying the elderly and so on. And 